Welcome to Greater Brockton. I'm Mark Lindy, your host, and today I have a special edition of Greater Brockton. We are going to talk about Brockton Kids Count, and who better to have here with me than Superintendent of Schools Kathleen Smith. Welcome. Hi, thanks for having me. Thanks for coming in. You are going to be busier than you always are, Kathy, because now we have to cope with and deal with arithmetic changes with budgetary numbers for the Brockton Public Schools. Now, what am I talking about? I, I've gone to the meeting, I'm an elected official for Southeastern, and they had a, a summit with all the school committee members, the city councilors, and the mayor, uh, a little, maybe six weeks back over at the War Memorial. But funding for schools, and for our great Brockton Public Schools, are in serious jeopardy in question. Tell us about it. Well, I think you have to look back uh, to 1993 with the advent of ed reform coming in, and I always remind everybody it was the McDuffie case out of Brockton that made some real changes to the way funding happened for kids uh, across the Commonwealth, and especially important to kids in urban districts. And if you remember back then, there were class sizes where there were 35 students in a class, kids were sitting on radiators, didn't have updated curriculum, and it was all about equity in education. That's what that case was about. And Chapter 70 funding formula came in because it said, no matter where your zip code, every child should have equal opportunity. Mm -hmm. So years go by. And for a while, it made a great difference for Brockton kids. But after a while, the formula was not working for urban districts. It wasn't working for some of the suburban districts. And the formula allows uh, the state to support the district with a certain amount. And in Brockton, it's about 80%. We get state support. And out of that, the other 20% is made up, again, by our city. So in looking all these years, uh, the funding uh, became less and less appropriate for an e equity in education for a child that we spent the last two years, and we made sure Brockton was a player. So under Deval Patrick, a commission was set up. It was called the Chapter 70 Review Commission, mm -hmm. where uh, legislators, senators, representatives, superintendents, school committee members, throughout the Commonwealth went geographically the whole state of Massachusetts to hear what the different communities had to say. Why wasn't it working? We had Aldo Petronio, our business manager, at every single one of these public hearings talking about the low-income formula and the needs of our low-income families, homelessness, talking about special education population, talking about our English language learners, talking again about social and emotional issues that we're dealing with, never mind the mandates coming down, mm -hmm. the online testing, the technology for the 21st century, new buildings. So we were at every one of those hearings and we're very excited to see changes coming in this Chapter 70 funding formula. Lo and behold, we have had two budgets that were very difficult for us to sustain the type of education you would want in the city for our children. And what happened in this budget was the Chapter 70 Review Commission was ignored, and the governor's proposal ended up giving Brockton very little. As a matter of fact, if you look at the increase in revenues in the state, they were up by 4.3%, if I have my numbers correct. Mm -hmm. I believe the Chapter 70 budget was about 1.2% increase, and Brockton had a 0.2% increase overall. Mm -hmm. And we are very dependent on that state funding, very different than some of our neighbors in the suburbs. So that is what started the whole crisis, okay? And we're not going to get into this part, but I know coming down the road in the future, there's a charter school that's coming to Brockton as well that is going to take funding away from the Brockton Public Schools. So. What are the ramifications of this new funding formula? It, it, it sounded pretty grave to me when I attended that meeting. Yeah. Well, again, and this is not just the schools. I know the city also, uh, municipal government, has a stressed budget, and people want to blame everything. You know, they want to blame settling of contracts, labor unions. The truth is, I want teachers in the city of Brockton that want to come here. Mm -hmm. It's a heavy lift coming here. Mm -hmm. I want to have the best teachers. I want to have highly qualified teachers. And just looking at the contracts, we have over uh, almost 3,000 employees. 1,400 of them are mm -hmm. our teachers in the system. A fair and equitable contract. Our teachers took two years of, of close to zero. And I know many families out there are struggling. Mm -hmm. And I understand that. But we were able to settle a contract. I thought it was a fair contract. 
but again it came due this year when you take two years with just about zero the last couple of years of the contract you know you're now again putting the money forward to make sure that you're keeping a competitive workforce so along with that with the lack of increase in funding that we wanted to see we started this budget season once the numbers came down from the state because again we're very dependent on those numbers looking at a ten million dollar deficit well, and that's a real number that is not um, I've heard people say you know some of my friends that aren't as supportive of public education as I am of course oh they get they, tons of money it's plenty of money there's too many people and da 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 and I'm like you gotta be kidding me because I actually know what a school budget looks like being on a different school committee um, but there were there were 4,500 Brockton students that aren't being counted properly in this whole formula, correct? Well, I started out by telling you that again, we went around the state to look at this chapter 70 formula. Mm -hmm. One of the things that we talked about was please look at our poverty, our low income students. You know, these are students coming to us, as I said, five and 600 students homeless. Mm -hmm. You know, students that are displaced. If you can imagine going home to a one room type of apartment, a mm -hmm. hotel room is what it is, right. many of our students. Uh, never mind, you know, the, the stress uh, of living in that situation, not having those kinds of supports. Uh, our children are dealing with uh, social and emotional issues. Uh, we're dealing with, we have trauma sensitive schools. So we were looking to see increases. And frankly, what happened was, without notification to any of us, there is a movement throughout the country to do what's called directly certified when you look at low income. Mm -hmm. So previously, we would look at lunch forms, free and reduced lunch forms. Mm -hmm. And we do an excellent job. We hired somebody to support parents that are not speakers of the English language to make sure they understood, get the documents filled out. And we had close to 82% free and reduced lunch. Mm -hmm. What happened with this new formula, it's called directly certified. If in fact you're a family that is on some type of assistance, Mass Health, SNAP, uh, Department of Children and Families, a number of those directly certified numbers. Mm -hmm. You would be who they would count in the formula. So in looking at all told what happened in the formula, it's not that we lost 4,500 children, but when they did the calculations, 4,500 of our children out of about 15,000 came off of the so-called poverty, high poverty rolls. Mm -hmm. And it's a $6 million hit right away if you talk about the money we got for those same students that were sitting in our class last year. We are held harmless for, for a year, but there's no guarantee going forward. And we were looking, as I told you in the beginning, for an increase. When we went around and spoke throughout the state, we talked about the heavy lift with our students that are living in poverty and what we needed as, again, a, a city that is poor, frankly. Mm -hmm. And that was not what we needed in the budget. So that was a hit right away. Again, held harmless this year, concerned about the increase that we were looking to get and all of those other things that we talked about for a year that a review commission took in from suburbs, urban, rural, none of them were looked at in this formula. And I'll tell you something else. When I look at this governor's budget, and I had the opportunity to speak before the House Ways and Means, and actually uh, was representing, uh, was a person representing out of a team of three, the Mass uh, Association for School Superintendents. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't just my representation of Brockton, but talking about how this uh, formula is just efficient, you know, out of the get-go. So the, there is an increase. The governor will tell you there's an increase in this budget of Chapter 70 of 72 million. Mm -hmm. And I'll tell you one thing. If you look at a graph that we did, it was divided into what they call deciles. And if you take $72 million, and if you looked at decile one, which didn't get the most money, and I'm talking about some of this directly certified and along with other calculations, there were 11 communities that split $6 million. You go down the other 10 deciles, when you get to the 10th decile, and that's the largest amount of money, there were 195 communities splitting $10 million. Six million, for 11 communities, 10 million for 195, most all of your urban districts, and that's where we lost our 4,500 students, a direct hit to the funding that we needed in this city. In this school system, unlike, I mean, like different school systems, we make sure we serve everybody, okay? We, we, we have all the challenges with special ed and English language learners and things like that, and some of these other communities don't. I remember hearing in that meeting, correct me if I'm wrong, I read the big packet, I'm not sure I digested it or understand all of it, 
but like a community like a Lexington that does not have the same amount of challenges with the, the students they serve, they're actually getting a huge increase. Well, they were part of that decile one, if I recall. Mm -hmm. And again, we're not looking to take money from any other community. No. But governor, please fund us fairly. So again, there is a process. It does go through the House and the Senate. I can't say enough about you mentioned our city council, our school committee, our legislative group, our mayor, you know, coming together to look at the challenges we're facing and making sure as it makes its way through the House and the Senate that there hopefully will be eyes on this and changes that will be made. What those changes are, I don't know, hence our big kickoff campaign coming for the city uh, this evening. Now, is it too late for this year's budget, or do you think there's a possibility that there could be legislative relief that they could go over and above mm. what the, I mean, the governor, it's a similar situation in a sense. The mayor sets the budget, the council cuts the budget. How does it work on the state level? I'm not sure I'm exactly the person to ask, but okay. what I understand is, again, it was the governor's budget right. that has been put forward and it does go through the House and they can make changes. Okay. And it goes through the Senate and they can make changes. Okay. You know, how they come to a budget in the end, we probably won't know till somewhere towards late May. And isn't there a problem with a lag in funding where students aren't counted in the year that you serve them? You Correct. almost have to wait yeah. an entire year? Well, it's about 18 months lag. So you're talking about, we can have a year where on October 1st, we give a per pupil count to the state. And mm -hmm. that's what we count on, you know, for our 80% from the state for our funding. So you like to make sure that on October 1st, every student is counted. They're in those classrooms, they're sitting there, because that'll be your funding for the next fiscal year. Many times from October 1st, especially a community like Brockton. And if you talk demographically right now, I am sitting with superintendents, again, around the Commonwealth, where they are looking demographically at a shift down that there are going to be less students in grades K to 12 in the next, let's say, 10 to 12 years. We're seeing the very opposite. So we are a city that continues to still grow. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's hard to talk demographically when students are moving in from other countries, other places. It's hard to do that kind of a study. You could have from October 1st to the end of the year in June before you start in September an increase of over 400 students and they're sitting in front of you. Those are real kids, they need real teachers, and they take up places in our classroom. And like you talked about the technology before, I recall listening to at school committee meetings and different meetings I've attended to that because of those new requirements, those new mandates you were talking about, you need the new technology. I mean, I, video equipment, audio equipment, computers, anything that you have, there's, there's, there's no more seven-year depreciation schedule no. and a shelf life. It's, it's a boat anchor after X number yeah. of years. We could do a whole show on that, certainly. Okay. You know, but, but that conversation, you're, you're referring to uh, the conversation where we were a state where the high stakes testing for the student to graduate in 10th grade to get their high school diploma uh, or by 12th grade was our MCAS test. We have been testing out what they call PARC, and it does have an online forum. Now, the commissioner and the Board of Education has voted just this past fall that going forward, they weren't going to select MCAS over PARC. They're going what they're calling with uh, MCAS 2.0. Mm -hmm. So it will have all of the um, high quality uh, you know, testing material that we had for our students. And again, we're a state that has been number one in the type of achievement of our students, very rigorous testing. So it will continue to have those components, but it also will have that technology piece. So my present sixth graders, they again, 2019 is when this new MCAS 2.0 comes in where all students at this point have to take it online. Mm -hmm. And we are not a community where every student has internet access or one-to-one -one devices in their homes. It does come down to the schools making sure that from the time the child comes to us in preschool or kindergarten, all the way through that 10th grade when they're taking that test, that they have had opportunities. Like you said, it's a whole new world for these students. Mm -hmm. You and I went to school, it was paper, it was pencil, it was a book, you know, it was curriculum. And although you still have some of that and need that, these children are learning in ways that, you know, what we're teaching them now or the jobs we're preparing them for are going to change every year for the next, you name it, so many years. So you need to be ahead of the game. And again, when you're talking a community that is reliant upon the state, then we're cutting our budget the past two years because of a stress city budget. And we keep cutting our budget. So naturally, I have to have teachers in the classroom. 
I'm cutting the money that we've put aside for technology in the budget. Mm -hmm. It continues to put our children behind the so-called eight ball. Now, everything seems to be on the table for this. This is, I, I looked at the website and I saw all these finance subcommittee meetings posted almost pretty much weekly. I remember you guys going through that the last two years with the last two budgets. It's even more extreme this time. It's, it, I, I get people, oh no, they, they've always hired them all back, they've all come back. That didn't happen last year. It there did were not. quite a lot of teachers that were gone. Well, we started out with 120. Uh, we were able to bring back 60, and we had 60 that were laid off. And I still have class sizes out there. I was up at the high school just recently in a lab class. Excellent teaching going on. 35 kids in those classes. And I started out by talking about 1993 in the McDuffie case. And that was brought forward because you had kids at Brockton High School sitting on the radiators without books in front of them and no seats in the class. And that's where you are today. There are 27 children in our kindergarten classes on average. You go to any of the surrounding towns, there's 14 to 15 kids in a kindergarten class, as it should be for those early learners, those children in school for the first time. Now add the layer of poverty, add the layer of English language learners, and now that 27 looks quite a bit different. Mm -hmm. So again, yeah. these are, you talk about stresses on the budget. This is very real this year. Um, and, and I'm gonna tell you, I take offense when I sit and I hear, and I'm not a blog person, I'm not social media at all. And I, I know people, you know, it's a whole new world. I'm just not there yet. Mm -hmm. and, mm -hmm. and I say that for a reason, because I know talk out there and it's easy to say, well, you know, top heavy, too many people. Now, just if the uh, meeting last Tuesday, we cut 1.5 million for, from our administrative staff. And the one thing I wanted to make clear to the school committee and the community, this is not the direction you want us to go in. There are many mandates coming down from the state. It has weakened your school system. It isn't getting a system in check that's out of whack. You are a level three district, which is for any urban district, you're the last level three urban district in the state. And quite honestly, we should be higher than that other than some of our subgroups and graduation rates. It's not the achievement. We are narrowing that achievement gap. You know, your teachers are doing an excellent job and I started out talking about making sure we're hiring that high quality teacher. You know, making sure that we're dealing with closing that achievement gap for students that walk in today and haven't sat foot in a, you know, a classroom in the United States since the day they were born. And we're making a difference for those kids. But it makes a difference, the supports that you have, the interventions, the coaching. You know, I have administrators in the building, you know, talking and doing professional development, talking about technology, you know, looking at, again, the new testing that's coming in. Um, so all of this is going to make a difference in this community. So you're looking to bring out the community voice so people can rally to deal with this and that's what the whole campaign is all about. Yeah. This, this is, I believe in this community. I've lived here for over 30 years. My children were educated in the Brockton Public Schools. You know, and, and the story that I'll tell tonight, again, is I understand the stress on people's budgets. You know, and I will tell you, I mean, long ago, my children are now in their 30s, but when they were in college, my husband and I worked two and three jobs to make sure that our kids could have and could be competitive with other kids, opportunities for college, programs, you know, go overseas on exchange, all of those wonderful things that allow these kids to be successful as they compete in, in a world that you need to compete in. So that being said, I have faith, and it isn't just about dollars, but it's really talking about what we want this community to look like. So when you talk about Brockton kids count, our kids count. Our kids need to have, and as a community, we need to be talking about whether we have to have debt exclusion or an override vote, it is incumbent upon us to put it out there to the community. And it isn't just about parents that have kids in the school system. If I'm somebody that's elderly, if I'm somebody without children, my house value matters in this city. Mm -hmm. And it matters as far as the kind of educational system and what our expectations are for our students. Do we want them falling behind? Do we want to have kids dropping out? You know, we don't want those things. We are a successful school district. I love the idea of bringing all of these voices together. Parents, community members, clergy, nonprofit, elected officials, elderly, everybody that lives here. Let's talk about what we want. Do we want, you should already be talking about your Brockton High is 50 years old. Mm -hmm. I, I was lucky I went there when it was five years new. And you look at it, and you, you guys have done a very good job of keeping things up, except you can't possibly keep up. When you're worried about having the money for the teacher to teach the students, 
you guys have cut back on the monitor teaching assistants. The te There's so many kids in the classroom, you can't stuff all those kids okay. in the same classroom, and the rugs still need to be and fixed. And they're not 21st the century classrooms. Need. Right. They're, they're not. not 21st century classrooms. You should have a facility master plan, and the mayor is working on this, including our ci city facilities. Right. But you have 25 school buildings, mm -hmm. and you should be looking at your Brockton High School. We should be building, and we get 90% reimbursement from the state. Mm -hmm. So we have to pay that other 10%, though. We have to talk about, is it important to us? And you can have a 20-year plan, but you should be talking about an addition to that Brockton High of a STEM building, and then being able to take down each of your other buildings, mm -hmm. red, green, uh, yellow, and azure, yeah. and making sure that you're then renovating over a 10-year period, a five-year period, whatever it takes. You should be looking at the growing population on the south side of the city. The Huntington School, while I love that parade, and that building has a lot of history in it, and I'm sure we can find use for it, mm -hmm. but it's not for a 21st century classroom anymore. Nope. We need to start to pay attention to what we need. Do we need a facility or a technology plan in the district to talk about digital curriculum for these students? And again, it's not something that's going to be created overnight. It's right. changing the classroom of today to the classroom of tomorrow. You all know in your own homes this is changing. It's changing the way we do things. How many people pay bills online? Just think about the books. The books. Nowadays, it's much easier and more cost effective to get the books online. But like you pointed out earlier, a lot of our students don't have the technology at home. Okay, that's why the library is so popular because we have a line out the door for people to use because yeah. when school closes, that's what's open. They don't have the computer at home. They yeah. can't afford the internet access, so they depend on the schools. And the schools want to be depended on. We are there. The teachers are there to teach the students to provide after school opportunities. These are things also, when you talk about tonight, and as I keep saying, I believe in this community voice, and shame on people that because we are a community where people are probably working two and three jobs and they're counting on the schools and they're counting on government to support the things they need to do. But I think the time is right where you are going to start to hear parents' voices about what they want for their children and their community. So my hope tonight is everybody comes out. We're going to be asking parents' opinions. We're having team leaders from each of the schools to try to rally, again, the parents, the aunts, the uncles, the grandparents, those people that make up the wonderful community of Brockton. And you raised a very good point, okay? If you're talking senior citizens who are on fixed incomes, mm -hmm. the schools educated your kids. You may have grown older. I think it's every generation's responsibility to help the next generation. Someone helped my kids go to school. When I was at Hancock School back in the day, it was five years new then. West Middle School when I was there, it was built in the 50s, I was there in the 70s. It was only about 20 years yeah. old, but there's still, some of the, the same buildings are still there. My mom taught in all the buildings. She was laid off under the original two and a half and ended up at six different schools because she never had a permanent placement after that. She ended up at one of the oldest schools in the city, the Whitman School, which really had no facilities, certainly not at 21st century. The school had a lot of heart and soul like all of our schools Absolutely. do. Absolutely. Okay, and you can look at the new ones. Brockton's done pretty well over the years mm -hmm. with the reimbursement because of creativity. I remember sitting as a student advisory council member at Brockton High when Bob Jones was the guy that was in charge of facilities. And he used to come in with a slideshow. And he said then, close to 40 years ago, just what you're saying now, that we have to have a plan, plan. and we have to keep <laughs> up with it. And it just seems like we're getting further and further behind and this hurts it. You're talking class sizes. Now, something that's really scary that I saw in some of the research that I did, and thank you and your staff for giving me some of the info and, and doing a little independent work, but um, we've never had sports fees here, ever, ever. We've, we're a poor community, but we've never charged kids to use sports. Yeah, and we shouldn't. And we, we, should shouldn't. Not, we should not have the haves and the have-nots. Right. And it isn't just sports. I mean, athletics seems to be the things that many of us want to talk about where Obviously, a, a community, and I don't just mean Brockton, I mean, you know it, it's the Red Sox, it's the Patriots, it's, and that's great. I love what that brings, certainly, to our region. Mm -hmm. But truth be told, in an urban district, we want kids doing these things. It's healthy to have them on the athletic fields, teams, working together, competition, parents coming out and supporting them. I'm going this Saturday, our drama club, and we expect this to happen is in the finals in Boston. Mm -hmm. It's one of the only urban districts that continues to be competitive and to be in those finals because other communities have cut a drama program. We have kept a full program. We make sure that there are opportunities with arts. 
your children are coming away with excellent instruction in arts, fine arts, uh, you know, music programs, bands, symphonies, orchestras, you name them. This is happening. And as you said, I talk to people in the surrounding towns and they're paying, many times parents are paying a fee, there's a cap on the fee depending on the number in the family, but you're talking hundreds of dollars to take part in a sporting activity. You're talking transportation. Parents are paying to have their children transported. We are not a community that we are willing to have the haves and the have-nots. We need to take care of our children. You know, one of the things, and it's interesting because years ago, I can remember somebody saying, you know, what's happening? Are we going to be feeding the kids after school? Well, interesting enough, we have after school programs, and I love that we have a program that feeds kids after school. We right now have a breakfast in the classroom where every child in our elementary schools, it's growing to our middle schools, has an opportunity, whether you're the wealthiest child in the city through a program with reimbursement or the poorest child. You have a breakfast in front of you every day for 10 minutes. A child is able to eat, they're able to focus for certainly the rest of the day till lunchtime. They all have a little snack during snack time. It's a fabulous program. We're bringing in dental care for parents to, mm -hmm. to help them to, for some of the simple things and then to refer them out. So we are a community. We're very much an urban community that takes care of our children and our families. And it's time again for the community to come together. We need political activism in every way, shape and form to let our government know at the level again uh, of Governor Baker and his team. Certainly, our legislators are supporting us in every way. We need to be talking to our congressmen about grants and about funding, technology, bonding. All of these things need to be strong discussions that are happening. And Brockton people need to have a voice. And I'm hoping that voice is going to support education. Well, I'm sure it is. They gave me the three-minute cue, believe it or not. We've been here pretty much most for the whole half an hour. Say how you can help. Talk directly to the to viewers out there in, in your voice. Well, you know, you can help in so many ways. Um, we are, the campaign starts with our wonderful, I'd love to see this lawn sign on every home in the city. And it isn't just about funding for this budget. When we talk about Brockton Kids Count, it starts a dialogue. A dialogue, again, about what we want our facilities to look like. What kind of technology infrastructure do we want to have? What kinds of class sizes? How will we support the diversity in our community, our English language learners? And this isn't a job any one person can do. So if you're a parent that's busy, some family member needs to come out when we have community meetings. We're getting team members at every one of the schools to talk about a letter writing campaign. Tonight, I'm really hopeful when we meet and have our, our meeting at the Iron Own School that we will actually get ideas from you. So there is our website. We will have a number that you can call to get involved and we'd love to see every family come together. I'd love you to march on the State House. I'd love you to make sure you tell our mayor how important it is that we find a way to support these initiatives in our community. Well, we're going to be with you every step of the way. I wouldn't be yeah. sitting in this chair in this TV studio if there wasn't a TV studio at Brockton High when I went there. That's correct. Okay, That's so right. Thank you for doing what you yeah. do. And thank we'll you, follow Mark. the campaign, and we'll be certainly glad to give any publicity we can do to help. I appreciate it. Thank okay. you. You are watching Greater Brockton. Mark Lindy, your host. Stay tuned for more events, places, people, and faces right here in the City of Champions.